Welcome to the Global Vaccine Summit. It really reflects the global unity in improving child health. It's really amazing to find UN agencies, companies, um, governments, religious le leaders all around in, uh, under one roof, working together in order to make sure that all children, regardless of who they are, where they are, have access to a decent, healthy life through providing vaccination. Um, our session now will be to reinsure our commitment to our goal. Um, during our discussion with our uh, distinguished panelists, we will uh, share ideas, stories of success, um, plans, which will uh, ensure also that uh, integration, collaboration is in high level or on high level and high standards also. Uh, the discussion will start with three minutes uh, remarks from our uh, panelists. Uh, maybe we have to squeeze it into two minutes. Um, and uh, also, um, uh, after that, we would like to hear from uh, uh, our audience during the open discussion that we will have. Um, of course, please make sure that your comment or question is brief, straight to the point. Mention the person in question. We'll have uh, mic runners here around, so if you have a question, just raise your hands, make it clear, and they'll come to you. Uh, but uh, let us first start with introducing our guests. Next to me directly is um, um, uh, Sultan Mohammed Saad Abu Bakr III, Sultan of Sokoto from Nigeria. Uh, then we'll have Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, King Abdul Aziz University, Saudi Arabia. And after that, um, we can see Mr. Bekele Galeta, a very musical name, Secretary General, International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Society. Um, uh, Sania Nishtar, Federal Minister for Education and Training, Science and Technology and Information Technology, Pakistan. Dr. Cyrus uh, Ponawala, Chairman and Managing Director, Serum Institute of India. And also we have uh, Mr. Anthony Lake, Executive Director, UNICEF. And we start with you, sir, with the first remarks. Welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, it, it is wonderful to be here. I'm sorry, I do not have a musical name, uh, Tony <laughs> Lake. Uh, let me begin, uh, first of all, by saying what a wonderful start that was last night and again this morning. I want to speak very briefly about history, which was mentioned this morning already a number of times. Uh, history in a number of different ways. First of all, uh, the fact, as Bill Gates pointed out, uh, and indeed he is responsible for so much of it, we are on the brink of making history in eradicating polio once and for all. But the other side of it is that if we don't eradicate polio now, history is going to judge us very harshly, and it should do so. But the third point is I want to talk a little bit about the history of routine immunization. Uh, yes, the 1980s were a glorious time, uh, and by 1990, uh, the world had uh, proclaimed that it had reached universal coverage, which was defined then as about 80%, uh, and we were close. But the fact is that since 1990, there has been progress, and with population growth, a lot more people have been immunized, but we're still, in a percentage terms, not that far above still 80%. And we have to make universal immunization more nearly universal now in the coming years. This is true, as was discussed last night, in closing the gap between the poorest nations and the richest nations. But it is also the case that within nations, we have a lot of work to reach into those areas of greatest disadvantage. Uh, we have done studies, in fact, that showed that over recent years, the gap between the poorest children and the richest children within nations uh, within a majority of nations that are on track to reach MDG4 is actually growing. And we should not be presiding over an increase in this injustice. So there are many reasons why we need to be focusing on those hardest to reach areas. One of them is that it is simply right. Another is that by definition we are not going to defeat polio and measles, all the other uh, killers of children with a miracle of vaccines, if we don't work 
in those areas. But another, and that may be surprising to some of you, is that our studies show that because the results are greatest where the needs are greatest, a vaccination program where there is a great deal of disease will save more lives than in an area where there is less disease. Our studies show that the results outweigh the additional costs of working in those areas. So this is a cost-effective strategy as well. And doing the right thing is also the practical thing in getting uh, up to 90% and above in those poorest areas. And in fact, recent modeling showed that if we could get up to around 90% in some 72 of the poorest countries, we can, by 2020, we can save six million children's lives just through those vaccinations. That's really very interesting, and maybe we'll discuss more later and on. One last break. point, if I may. I'll give you okay. 20 seconds. How do we do it? Through all of us, through governments, through UN agencies, and especially at the community level, through the kinds of community workers we saw last night so wonderfully, and I hope that they will inspire us, and I hope especially that the photographs of all those children who will now lead full lives, live fully, uh, because of the miracle of vaccines, will inspire us all as well. Thank you, sir. Doctor, you have three minutes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, distinguished uh, delegates uh, and friends, uh, I'll uh, confine my two or three minutes to uh, the a vaccine manufacturer's perspective and to give this August uh, audience here an idea of uh, what Serum Institute's contribution is uh, made so far and will continue for the most important target that Mr. Bill Gates was driving this to reach every child. <clears throat> uh, on the outset, I must say that if it hadn't been for Bill, to take so much interest and sacrifice his personal time and wealth, I think this uh, target would have been more difficult to reach than perhaps it will now. Having said that, uh, Serum Institute of India, uh, which started as a very small company many years ago, uh, entered the field of uh, protecting children right from its incept and uh, there was a shortage of all vaccines first in India, which we made available by a game, ch a game change in my strategy, that when we launched all our vaccines, the first thing we did is we launched it at half the price of everybody else. And therefore, we became a leader in the country. The same game change was done with the world, where there was a shortage of DPT, measles, and other vaccines that UNICEF was uh, uh, requiring. We entered, we crashed the price, we saved hundreds of millions of dollars of UNICEF and Gavi money, and we continue to do so. And with the net result that I'm very happy to uh, draw your kind attention, that out of the 72 countries, I think 80% of all children immunized uh, through the vaccines made affordable by Serum Institute. Uh, the next question is polio. Same story I hope to repeat and achieve in polio. At the moment, the injectable polio vaccine is at a very high uh, price, and uh, we have acquired a company uh, who is uh, one of the pioneers in making a salt vaccine in, in Holland, Hiltoval Biologicals, and through them, I propose to crash the price to half start with and make available vaccines, uh, especially the IPV now, uh, to join hands with Gavi, Mr. Gates, and the rest of the magnanimous donors, so starting with uh, several countries, including UAE now, to uh, see that every child has access with a prompt delivery and uh, affordable price of polio, along with measles, DPT, pentavalent vaccine. And we really appreciate that. We really appreciate and we hope Pardon? that. We really appreciate that and we really hope that other uh, companies and manufacturers would uh, follow suit. Uh, Ms. Thank Zania, you. Um, if you'd like to say your remark. Thank you. Uh, I bring greetings to you from the government of Pakistan. We'd like to thank the government of United Arab Emirates for hosting this very important meeting 
and we'd like as a government to pray, pay rich tribute to Mr. Bill Gates for his unwavering efforts and generosity to eradicate a disease for the second time from the face of this planet. We are also extremely thankful to the World Health Organization for their efforts and for their technical support that they are lending to us in our country. Uh, Pakistan is very much in the global, uh, on the global stage because of polio and because of the recent resurgence of measles. We are one of the three countries in the world where polio continues to be a problem and we are very committed to addressing that. Uh, as far as immunization in Pakistan goes, I think the dynamics and the underlying determinants are a story of some heroic efforts, but some equally daunting challenges, and I think I'd like to explain them very briefly. Uh, for a very long time, since decades, successive Pakistani governments have been very committed to the cause of immunization and specifically to polio. So we've had several presidents, prime ministers, first ladies appearing publicly, committing their support for vaccination. A number of different normative frameworks have been created. We have an accelerated action plan for polio. The entire administrative machinery of the government of Pakistan, including human resources, at the grassroots level are at the disposal of polio eradication. But despite that, despite the commitment of resources, despite political will, there are constraints. And the Pakistani government is, has a number of impediments in terms of translating this political commitment into reality and into actual impact. There are several reasons for that. The first reason is that over the number of years, because of challenges of governance, the capability of the delivery teams to vaccinate on ground has been quite badly eroded. Secondly, we have to be mindful of the fact that in vast swaths of land and vast swaths of very difficult geographic territory, there are access issues. There are organized factions which systematically challenge the writ of the state orchestrating refusals by parents on the mistaken notion that vaccination is haram and forbidden in the religion. Uh, and of course, you're all well aware about how the criminal element has interplayed to this, uh, which unfortunately led to the tragic killings of polio workers end of last year and continuing, continuing well into January this year. On top of that, of course, there is now a huge polio economy. So there are impediments and there are, there's, there are organized factions who would not like to see this goal achieved. Uh, and to top, it, uh, to, to, to top it all, we have had a very aggressive decentralization of responsibilities through a constitutional amendment, which although has augured very well for the body politic of the country in general, but has created problems for health because of the inadvertent fragmentation of health that it has created. So, so we need to discuss today how to overcome these exactly. challenges, maybe. And now uh, I'll have to move the, to Mr. Bekele. The mic is yours. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and Madam Chair. I wish to take this opportunity to thank His Excellency, the Prince of Abu Dhabi and uh, Mr. Bill Gates for hosting this important summit, which impacts on the well-being of uh, the children of the world. Let me start by paying tribute to the Afghan Standard Crescent Society's mobile health team. A driver and a vaccinator killed last week while providing medical assistance to people who live in remote areas and have difficulties to access health care in Georgian province. This tragic episode is just an example of how our volunteers and staff risk their lives every day to provide equitable access to health care for the most vulnerable in inaccessible areas. However, this incident only reinforces our resolve and commitment. We will continue to ensure that every child is immunized. Our members and volunteers come from these very communities, and as you know, Red Cross, Red Crescent National Societies are auxiliaries to their governments and they work closely in partnership according to Red Cross, Red Crescent principles. We firmly believe in the, the central role of uh, community-led engagement and greater access in reaching our immunization goals. The International Federation of Red Cross is a distinctive network of national societies which works in 187 countries with over 13 million active volunteers. 
in the most difficult circumstances from conflict situation like in Syria and Afghanistan to natural disasters like the recent earthquake in China and under normal circumstances, Red Cross, Red Crescent societies, every day their volunteers provide access to health services in every community. We speak their language. We live in these communities because we are part of the community and engage with their, com their community leaders. We are therefore trusted and accepted as at the grassroots everywhere. In Nigeria, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, one of the institutions with wide and, deeply, uh, wide and deep presence are Red Cross and Red Crescent societies. Today, we are also combining the, pow the power of mobile technology to optimize the work of our volunteers and scale up successfully our health programs worldwide. From the Terra Trilogy Emergency Relief Application System in Haiti and Sierra Leone to RAMP, Rapid Mobile Phone Based Survey Methodology, we are seeing how technology can help us bridge the digital divide to improve services to reach that last mile. Maybe we'll go uh, about that in detail during the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, of course, uh, Mr. Rebekelli wanted 15 minutes, but uh, we said three minutes is more than enough, but, and we'll talk more about it uh, during the discussion. Well, basically, please note that we might be speaking in Arabic, so make sure that uh, the handset is ready if needed. Um, uh, Sheikh uh, Abdullah um, would like to hear your comment. We will listen to your comments in a few minutes, and then we will talk about the issues in the eyes of the eyes. Please. In the name of the Lord, 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 the أيها السادة، أيها الإخوة والأخوات، أيها الكارم الأفاضل السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أود أن أشكر الذين قاموا بهذه المبادرة التي أعتبرها نوعا من حلف الفضول وهو حلف جيد يتجاوز الثقافات ويتجاوز الأقاليم كما أشار إليه الشيخ نهيان قبل قليل في كلمته سأتحدث فقط أتابع ما قاله بعض الإخوة اثنان من المتحدثين فيما يتعلق بموقف بعض المجتمعات الإسلامية من قضية اللقاح وهنا ربما أرجع إلى التاريخ كما قال المتحدث الأول ليقول إن المسلمين كانوا سباقين في هذا المجال في القرن في نهاية القرن السابع عشر وبداية القرن الثامن عشر كانت الليدي مونت ديو تأخذ تتعلم اللقاح في تركيا سنة 1717 يمكنكم أن ترجعوا إلى هذه المعلومة ثم عادت إلى بريطانيا وكان البريطانيون يخافون من اللقاح فبعد ذلك مع الوقت طور اللقاح في بريطانيا وصار البريطانيون يلقحون عن الجدري الذي اليوم التاريخ هناك مجتمعات اسلاميه تخاف من اللقاح اذا هذه مشكله الجهل الجهل دائما مشكله الدين الاسلامي يحث على تداوي ويكفي من ذلك قول النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم تداووا يا عباد الله فان الذي انزل الداء انزل الدواء وهذا يدعونا إلى البحث العلمي أي لكل داء دواء كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فعلينا أن نبحث حتى نجد الدواء الإنسان في صراعه مع الوجود دائما كان يصارع ضد الحيوانات يصارع ضد كل يعني كل ما يمكن أن يعوق حياته ثم يصارع ضد المرض واليوم هذا جزء من الصراع فنحن نشكر من يقوم عليه العلماء يقولون ان الدين ان العلم علمان علم اديان وعلم ابدان والكلمه هو الامام الشافعي هذا يدل على اي قدر كان الناس يقدرون التداوي سواء كان قبل المرض وما يسمى بالوقايه او بعد المرض او التداوي العمل الذي تقومون به عمل جيد يمكن ان يساعدكم العلماء فيه وشراكه الشيخ محمد بن زايد معكم اعتقد انها ستحث العلماء على ان يقوموا بدور لتفهيم هذه المجتمعات 
أشكركم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله شكرا طبعا شيخ عبد الله سنتطرق بقضية دور العلماء علماء الدين في دعم مثل هذه القضايا بالإضافة إلى شكرهم طبعا على إذا تحتي لي فرصة مش أت... لا بعد شوي رح أعطيك <تصفيق> المجال شكرا <تصفيق> لك <تصفيق> سلطان محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على النبي الكريم Nigeria is a country of over 150 million people, almost equally divided between Christians and Muslims, and uh, with a very strong religious and traditional base. Ours is a success story of how religious and traditional institutions can partner and work very successfully with other stakeholders for the sake of humanity. It was not until Mr. Bill Gates visited us in Sokoto that really woke us up and sort of revitalized our efforts in what we have been doing in the last four years. I want to thank Mr. Bill Gates and all other stakeholders here for your support. We are totally committed as traditional and religious leaders to eradicate polio, childhood killer diseases, also check maternal mortality, and above all, kick away poverty from our land. We thank you all for your support and we continue to ask for more. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, we still have uh, one minute and 20 seconds. Any, any, anybody would like to buy these minutes? <laughs> no? <laughs> anyway, we'll start now. Um, uh, Mr. Anthony, basically we can see that we have the money. We have, we have the money and we have the vaccines and we have the willingness of the governments. We have the traditional and religious leaders supporting uh, the goal. What's missing? I don't believe that anything is missing. Uh, I think that what is required is the determination now to keep all the pieces in place and to work together uh, through a combination of global cooperation, such as we're seeing now, but even more importantly, local cooperative work uh, among all of us uh, at the country level and especially in the communities. Uh, so what are the and, challenges then? I'm sorry? What are the challenges then, uh, well, I think in the on what you said? In the communities, uh, it, it is very hard to, and I think this is a very important point, it is very hard to generalize about communities across the world. Uh, there are very different challenges in the different communities and we have to adapt to them. Uh, for example, in some communities you have high literacy rates, in some low. Uh, in some communities you can reach them by radio, some of them are in areas where you can't reach by radio, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have to adapt. Uh, and especially you have to, while you have community workers, often women, uh, lady health workers in Pakistan, uh, lady health nurses, uh, women health nurses in, in uh, Ghana, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you have to give the communities the sense that they own the process and that they are their workers, uh, not ours. Mm -hmm. But there are all ways of adapting. Uh, one of my favorites that I've heard about uh, is in Katanga in the DRC, uh, in which there was a magico Christian a community that had absolutely rejected vaccines. So we talked to, uh, with our colleagues in WHO, I believe, we talked to uh, a local religious leader uh, and worked out a process through which we could carry out uh, an immunization program after dark. You have booklet now from and, uh, with fatwas, right? Uh, you have a booklet or, with fatwas in order to spread yes, it all around, certainly, supported by the religious leaders. Yes, in it? Pakistan, when we ran into great problems, uh, again with WHO and all of our partners uh, in North Waziristan and South Waziristan, uh, some 180 religious leaders came together and issued a fatwa saying, as we have just heard, uh, that uh, Islam requires 
uh, that we work for the health of people. Uh, and then we broadcast the fatwa into these areas uh, with the government. Uh, and I think it made a big difference uh, in at least starting to increase our coverage there, and we will stay with it. One final point, it is vital, whether it is in Pakistan or in northern Mali, northern Nigeria, and all of these areas, that all of this be seen as non-political. Mm -hmm. uh, it is imperative that we never allow any of us to be drawn into partisan political differences that could then turn what is a wonderful uh, uh, effort for all of humanity uh, to get caught up any more than it has to be into the local politics that can defeat us. But regarding the religious part and the uh, refusal of some um, because of uh, religious background uh, to take the vaccination, in Nigeria, uh, Sultan Mohammed, in one of your statements, you said that uh, the murder of health workers wasn't religious. What was it then? We're talking about other challenges or what? Well, if you look at the general insecurity problem everywhere all over the world, not, not, uh, don't really bring religion into it. In some places, yes, there's a religious aspect of it. But in some, there are very big political dimensions to such things. Like in Nigeria, we believe what happened in Kano was a political gimmick. And uh, I think the Minister of Health is here at the next uh, uh, forum is going to expand, uh, expand more on that. Mm -hmm. But we don't believe it's, uh, it's a religious thing because uh, no religion, especially Islam, mm -hmm. allows anybody to take somebody's life unjustly. So we don't believe killing somebody is, a, is, is Islamic. Let us uh, uh, listen to, Mr., uh, to Sheikh Abdullah regarding that point and the role of the religious leaders in, um, in such cases. And in general, regarding uh, vaccination, Sheikh Abdullah, ma huwa dour aladi yumkin an yakum bihi rijal adin fi mithil hada sadad wa hal min dour li rijal adin fi alkharj baidan an manatik al-sirah aw al-manatik alati tatim fiha amaliyat al-talqih min dour aw la. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rijal adin daima yumkin an yakum na an yakum bi amali ma fi. للوصول إلى بعض الفئات والوصول إلى بعض المناطق التي قد تكون مناطق متخلفة وتحتاج إلى توعية دينية لكن الإشكال هو أن بعض هذه المناطق يوجد فيها أناس عندهم فكر منغلق هم يقتلون الناس يقتلون المسلمين ويقتلون غير المسلمين هذه إشكالية الفكر المنغلق هي تشمل قتل الناس وتشمل أيضا التطعيم هي هي إشكالية مركبة ولأجل ذلك على العلماء أن يبذلوا جهدا أن يبينوا بأن هذا ليس من الدين في شيء وأن الشرع الإسلامي يدعو إلى التداوي وأن هذا من الجرائم أن تمنع الناس أن يتعالجوا أن يكون الأهالي راضون عن راضين عن عن التداوي كيف فلا يمكن, يمكن ايصال هذه الرسائل انت من خلال تجربتك كيف كيف يمكن ايصال هذه الرسائل لهؤلاء الناس هو علينا اولا ان نضع البراهين هو الامر كما نقول يحتاج الى بيان والى برهان علينا ان نقدم بيانا واضحا عن هذا التلقيح وأن هذا التلقيح لا ضرر فيه طيب. وأن الذين يقومون بالتلقيح ليست لهم أهداف سياسية كما قال ولا أهداف أي أهداف استعمارية ولا غير استعمارية هذا يجب أن يكون واضحا وأن في الإسلام لا فرق بين مسلم وغير مسلم في العلاج النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أمر طبيبا مشركا أن يعالج رجلا مسلما لا فرق بين هذا أما البرهان فيحتاج أن نقدم الأدلة الشرعية الصحيحة حتى نوصلها إلى الناس ثم ثالثا بعد البيان والبرهان نحتاج إلى عنوان إلى عناوين العلماء الذين يمكن أن يتكتلوا ويتعاونوا ويتراسلوا فيما بينهم لإيضاح الصورة للناس والوصول إليه مثل, مثل الكتاب الذي أخرجته اليونسف والذي يحوي على فتاوى قليلا أنا كبير كبرت في السن أدرى؟ 
اسمعيني قلي ارفعي صوتك اقول مثال على ذلك كتاب الذي اصدرته اليونيسف والذي يحوى على فتاوى من كبار العلماء يتم توزيعه في باكستان وغيرها من المناطق وذلك لاقناع الناس حول هذه النقطه شكرا لك شيخ عبد الله ثانيه انتوني سيد ا فيري امبورتنت بوينت ذات اف وي نيد تو سولف اني بروبلم وي هاف تو ستارت فروم ذا روتس اند ذا جراوند You've been a, a civil worker. Now you're a minister, but still, tell me, where do you think you can give more? Well, as far as the polio context goes, I think there's a huge amount of mistrust at the grassroots level. And that mistrust just has to be allayed. Now, I completely understand that there are fatwas that have been issued and they've been documented in manuals. But I think we need to do a better job of communicating them at the grassroots level, which is where they will actually make a change in terms of inspiring trust. Uh, and on that note, I think we really have not fully tapped the potential uh, of the Saudi clerics and scholars on this matter uh, and, and the impact that, it, that they could have at the grassroots level in Pakistan. Because the Pakistani population holds the Saudi clerics and the Saudi government in general in very high esteem mm. for a number of different reasons. And if they were to come very openly, very squarely with messages and communicate them to the grassroots level, we personally feel that that will have an enormous amount of difference in terms of uh, the, the trust factor that needs to be created at this point in time. So that's one. Secondly, I think um, the, the access issue needs to be looked at squarely in the eye. We have to accept that we have access problems, that there is about 30% of the land mass in Pakistan where, this, where the, uh, you know, the civilian establishment just cannot set foot. And we need to forge creative partnerships with the military you know, to deliver vaccination to doorsteps. And that is by no means a draconian measure, as, as some experts tend to think. Mm. And I think we really have no option but to harness their outreach to deliver vaccination. Uh, and thirdly, a, a number of us are now thinking, you know, with respect to how this message resonates at the grassroots level, that what do we gain by identifying polio eradication so visibly with political figures? and with politics. If you de-link polio eradication and what, what it entails in terms of grassroots implementation from political figures from different factions coming and visibly uh, committing their allegiance to it, you might be able to do a better job mm -hmm. because the society is so polarized in their view vis-a-vis uh, -vis politics in, in our country. And, and you started with the mistrust. Uh, with it is your the comments. mistrust that has to be allayed. Of course, there are the traditional uh, programmatic issues of funding and implementation capacity and accountability and countering collusion and the rest of that. But the, the mistrust factor, number one, should not be underestimated. The mistrust is not only with the governments. Mistrust is also with the charity people, especially if we take the example, the plot of uh, killing Osama bin Laden, how it started, they used, they forged one of the charities, and uh, uh, there are lots of accusation of uh, charities like um, 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 dealing with the CIA, not going to certain areas which are uh, targeted by the um, uh, Dune strikes. Um, uh, Mr. Bekelli, regarding this point, how you can build, how your people build trust with uh, uh, other people with all this conspiracy theory uh, surrounding us? Well, um, Red Cross, Red Crescent uh, has been working for the last 115 years, 150 years, on Red Cross, Red Crescent principles. These principles are accepted, received across the front lines, across the board. We are non-political, non-religious. In all conflict countries today, the organization that works across the front lines is Red Crescent Red Cross. Now, why? All political groups have accepted Red Cross as neutral intermediary, Red Crescent as neutral intermediary. And therefore, we are, we are not saying, I'm not saying that Red Cross functions without a problem. There are problems, but despite these problems, Red Crescent, Red Cross, are the organization prog uh, problems or are we talking about problems with dealing with the people with the mentality and the attitude essentially all political parties or religious groups accept us as neutral intermediary that's very important that means 
we are not an island in a country, but we work with government, we work with oppositions as well on principles. Mm -hmm. Red Cross, Red Crescent principle. They know that, they accept that. And therefore, they let us function. I'm not saying we freely function everywhere, no. There are problems every now and then, there are gaps every now and then, but the institution that is globally received, accepted today, is Red Cross, Red Crescent. And that is what we are doing in uh, problem areas in Syria, uh, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in Somalia, in Sudan, etc. The Red Crescent societies are the primary access uh, organizations that are functioning today. Okay. Um, yes, Mr. Anthony. Could I, on this question of mistrust and the rejection of the immunizations, just add one fact? Because I think since it gets all the attention, we tend to overestimate uh, the, the size of the problem. Uh, but I believe the fact is that in Nigeria, Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan, when you can get to the families, it's only just over 1% of the families that actually reject it when you get that far. These so are official uh, uh, numbers and what? studies? These are official numbers and studies? Yes, it's yeah. about 1.2% of yeah. the families. Now, that leads to almost a third of the cases of polio, but when you can get to the families, uh, in fact, overwhelmingly, in almost 99% of the cases, uh, they will welcome doing this for their children, uh, which should right. encourage us as we work to get to that uh, final 1%. So who's the ex exaggerating the issue? Is it the media or is it what? Well, this is once we get to the families. And of course, in some areas, it's hard to get to the families. No, but I mean, the numbers reasons. are very, very low in considering to yes. what we think of what's yes, happening no, around exactly. with the rejection. So who's to be blamed? Exactly. I'm saying that the numbers are low mm -hmm. in comparison to what we hear about the rejection of the people mm -hmm. towards the vaccination and the charity workers. So who's to be blamed? Is it the media or is it that we're not uh, passing the message or, or what? Um, I learned long ago, never blame the media for anything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Cyrus, uh, basically uh, uh, you mentioned uh, what uh, your institution is doing, yes. Can you hear me properly? No, I can't. No, you can't hear me properly. Can't. I was just uh, telling you. Is it the me. mic or is it can't the... hear you properly at all? Okay, mm. I'll try to talk slowly and clearly. Mm. So, <laughs> basically, uh, I'm saying that you committed that you are going to uh, sell vaccines in the lowest price um, uh, and cost. Basically, how long can you afford that? Are there any incentives uh, that uh, you've been given your institution or or what? Good question. Uh, no, the, uh, we haven't received any incentives except uh, uh, lip sympathy. And uh, <laughs> I feel uh, quite uh, disappointed, in fact, both with Government of India and UNICEF, clearly, that uh, they've never sort of really appreciate in real terms uh, the contribution we have made whenever we have gone to them for any problems. Look him in the face. <laughs> I am trying to get an appointment to pour my heart out to him after, at coffee time, but he is still to give uh, time to me. I look forward to it very much. Yes. Good, thank you. No, we, read, we need to hear your comment. Very disappointing, the UNICEF is not, uh, well basically, um, the organizations are not uh, giving the full support, let's say, and uh, rewards for the uh, manufacturers. What work could be done in order to support them? Do we have any? Yeah, uh, yes, they're, they're all of the, my friends in UNICEF are here, but I just want to clarify, they're very kind, very polite, and on personal uh, very level. patient in hearing, but that's where it ends. And I, I'm a, a person who I don't believe in, uh, uh, kind words, I believe in action. Uh, Mr. Anthony, the smile is not enough. <laughs> so what else you can provide? He's been attacking you. He's disappointed. We, uh, uh, sorry, I sorry. Can interrupt. Sorry. It's not me. The developing country manufacturers, and there's one more here who's equally disappointed. Okay, can and we hear bi another, another voice? That's bi Biological Evans who's Anybody crashed? to support Dr. Yeah. Cyrus? Is Maima Chowdhury yes, uh, Maima please. here? Where is the mic, please? The Evans? He's not paid by you, huh? Because you know the name. <laughs> okay, anyway. Yeah. Uh, uh, I do know 
I do know that we have been working very closely with the drug manufacturers. Uh, we don't always agree on everything. Uh, with the Gates Foundation, with Gavi, with others, to do all we can to reduce the prices uh, of vaccines. UNICEF is the biggest purchaser of vaccines for governments uh, in the world. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the cup of coffee, uh, both for its caffeine content uh, and so that I can hear more about the details of what does surprise me, because I had thought uh, that we were all working together uh, quite closely on all of this. Sonia, but of course, it, it is a negotiation with the drug manufacturers, uh, as it is in our interest to bring the prices down as far as possible. And let me say that the producers uh, like this uh, of the more generic drugs have done a wonderful job uh, in the world they in, know that. In, in supply, and as uh, Bill Gates was saying last night. Words. In they bringing... need action. Sonia, you wanted to comment. I just wanted to go back to the point made about the mistrust factor. Yeah. And I completely agree with Tony that the 1.2% of the families at the population level uh, is, is the correct figure. Mm -hmm. But that those data were gathered a while ago. And since then, two things have happened. One, the CIA campaign, which, by the way, had nothing to do with polio eradication. Mm. And that, of course, the media hype subsequent to that, and of course, all kind of conspiratorial th theories have really signaled something uh, quite sinister. So that's one. And secondly, over the last year, there has been a very well orchestrated smear campaign against uh, vaccination, mm -hmm. which was actually motivated by the non bona fide commercial sector because of the stakes involved in procurements, etc. And those two factors have now aggravated the situation vis a vis the mistrust factors. And I just wanted to outline that, of course, the situation may have changed since then, mm -hmm. and we shouldn't be misled in thinking that that is not a problem to be tackled, which is why we think that the Saudi clerics mm -hmm. have such an enormous role and potential to, uh, you know, in yeah, terms of bilateral engagement. Uh, um, I think our, uh, oh, yes, please. Could you please introduce yourself first and then you can start your comment and make it short, brief, straight to the point. Okay, my name is Rada Hatim. I'm the executive director of Médecins Sans Frontières, MSF. So I have a doctor without borders. I have two points, the first one for serum, and uh, definitely the competition entering into the market had contributed enormously to lowering the prices. We can give one example of the price of the pneumococcal uh, vaccines, the three doses, buying it from the traditional multinational companies, it cost $21 per dose. Once the competition will enter, we have confirmation that this will can be brought down to $6 for the three doses. Mm -hmm. This is enormous and a huge contribution. For the UNICEF, I would like to say that in 2011, there had been a great efforts by UNICEF that contributed enormously to the transparency on the cost of production. And that had helped companies and countries in the third world negotiating better prices with multinational companies. So we would like to call upon UNICEF to continue these great efforts leading to the transparency on the actual prices of production. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, Mr. S uh, Dr. Uh, Cyrus, uh, um, can I, can uh, it's not your that? moral responsibilities that are uh, pushing you to yeah, push no, the prices can I down. Just, yes, I please. want to comment on the word yeah, transparency. Exactly. That's why I'm trying to uh, ask that question. My biggest grouse on UNICEF is lack of transparency. So I'm surprised you say that uh, uh, compared to PAHO, Pan American Health Organization, who is a UN agency, who, who, uh, we are one of their principal uh, suppliers. There's total transparency. And that is what I was going to tell my colleague here. And UNICEF, after repeated requests, there's lack of transparency, total lack of transparency. They don't even announce the results of the bids. And Let's not make the, the, uh, not the issue allegation, regarding the, bids, uh, the, uh, so, the UNICEF so the, as a whole. Let's talk about. Uh, I just want to talk about the. Um, uh, yeah, I, I want you to defend yourself rather than to attack the UNICEF. Uh, she's saying that uh, uh, it's not the moral, moral responsibility that's pushing the manufacturers to push the prices down. It's rather the competition, and anyway, the prices will go down anyway. No, we can only push the price down if we know that we are higher than somebody else. If there is no transparency and we don't know the results, we can't lower the price. Okay. 
Okay, Anthony, uh, Justice Moll, uh, short com uh, comment, yes. May I have the yes. right of reply for a moment? Short. Uh, and I stand to be corrected by the head of our supply division here. But during the bidding process, uh, it is very difficult to be transparent during the bidding process for the sake of the others who are bidding, which is what they require. But we have become, over the years, very transparent then in the results of the bidding. And for example, last year uh, on bed nets, uh, we, through transparency, had a dramatic uh, reduction in the prices of bed nets. So if there is a specific concern in one of our negotiations, I'd be glad to discuss it with the head of our supply division, but it is simply, if I may say so, inaccurate to say that we are completely transparent because we have become, uh, by any standard, as our colleague in MSF said, uh, extraordinarily transparent just over the last two years, and it has made a real difference in bringing down the prices. So um, basically, yeah, uh, Mr. Bekele, um, I wanted to ask you a question with regard to this conversation. When we talk about transparency uh, and mistrust, etc., because we're talking about a number of um, uh, different sectors, uh, different nationalities, we're talking about global. We can't, in one country, agree on one certain point. So it's really important to have some kind of uh, integration, collaboration between them. How can we build this integration and uh, full engagement between different parties. Is it easy? Do you find it easy? Well, I mean, essentially, I, I, will, I will talk from the, the side of the people. Um, what is very important is to change the way of life, the way of thinking, the attitude, the mindset. Families want to save their children. Now, they want to know what can save. Despite the religious belief, the, despite the political differences, if they know the reality that the children would be saved, then they can take their children for immunization. That is what we need to build. That okay, is what but if we have this point solved and we have less people who are not accepting the idea of the vaccination, what's the next step that all the parties need to do in order to, have the, uh, to, to, to achieve the goal in general and have full integration? Well, that is, that's, that's the partnership. The partnership that needs to be built between the government, the manufacturer, the civil society, uh, the academics included, the, the religious uh, leaders included, that's the partnership that needs to be pulled together. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's extremely important that uh, all, all the different sectors, all the mm -hmm. different uh, interests get together and, and create a partnership yes. into dialogue. Sultan Mohammed, uh, do you think that uh, com communicating with all parties is uh, going smoothly? Well, I believe uh, that is being done now. Because uh, right now, I'm here with uh, two major religious sects leaders. So it's not an issue of religion. And we are using them to get to the grassroots. Mm -hmm. So we are using both the traditional and religious leadership in our country to get to the last man who needed this vaccine. Before our involvement directly, there were thousands of cases of polio in Nigeria. Within the first one year of our engagement, we brought down the number of cases by 95%. Mm -hmm. And I want to support Mr. Blake when he said, there are a few numbers of polio cases remaining in the world compared to the billions that don't really need uh, these vaccines. So what we need to do here, we have the money bags, Mr. Bill Gates, Carlos Limanco. Yeah, in person. In We've got yes. one more question here at the back, please. <laughs> and we have the commitment here of both traditional and religious leaders and all other stakeholders, like the UNICEF, Gavi, and others. Manufacturers. So, so what we need is a final push Mm -hmm. by everybody with sincerity or purpose to drive out polio in the next couple and of we years. We've got one more and question that, at the back, please. One more question yeah. at the back, and, please. And we are that very close. So we should not stop because the momentum is with us. So we have to keep on uh, this push yeah. towards eliminating polio. Okay, let's listen to one of the comments here. Um, who, my who's got the my mic? question is this, I have the mic, I thank you. I can see you. 
I'm in the bar to your right. Hey, hi. Thank you. I'm Kathy Calvin with the United Nations Foundation. I'd like to bring the, and I thought the last statement was wonderful. Thank you. I wonder if you can come back to the title of the panel, how we reach that fifth child or every last child, as it says up there. That seems to be the, the point at which you're driving to now. And I think it would be useful to hear from the panel on what are the steps in those local communities defining and identifying and reaching that child. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, I have a comment on uh, uh, Her Excellency Sonia Nechter's comment. I definitely agree with her that uh, if scholars in the Muslim world, Saudi Arabia, comes with uh, fatwa and that is distributed uh, among uh, people in Afghanistan and Pakistan where we know that will have a great deal of impact uh, on the opposition uh, to polio. And I think recently the WHO held a meeting in, uh, uh, in Cairo. They, they invited many scholars and I think it will be very important that that fatwa is distributed as soon as possible. I think WHO will be doing this. But the reason that I'm commenting on something else and that is her uh, suggestion that we use the military to deliver vaccine. Mm. I think that will have a, a, a bring a difficulty if I know the, the Afghan and also the Pakistani so society. So you're talking it's, it's going to have a negative uh, effect if we use the military in doing that. Let so me what, explain. Let me explain. Well, well, Let we me explain. We don't really have time. Well, a military, military force will create counterforce and also in these two countries military is associated with foreign forces so that's so why if yeah. we use military that will be counterproductive okay. i hope we will not okay do that. thank you the com we heard the comment and um, we have final comment please and then we'll uh, um, conclude this session uh. My question is uh, from F Federation Secretary, and I see the Federation is involved in uh, some negotiation with the ORMA position group for allowing vaccination to be implemented in those areas, their influence of uh, ORM groups militants. But my question is how you can see the role of Federation and other uh, uh, important stakeholders to reaching these armed opposition groups, militants, where there is insecure areas, where they are, have control or influence in these areas, okay. how we can move forward to negotiate and talk with them. That is one of the insecurity or greatest problem challenge we are facing. We discuss many times, many years, but we are not targeting or directly moving towards. I see Federation has some local discussions, okay. but I don't see at country or regional level, including Afghanistan and Pakistan, to reach an agreement with these opposition groups uh, or opposition groups. Okay, this groups. is on political yeah. level, and maybe we, uh, this needs another session, but thank you very much. Uh, uh, your point is well uh, received. Um, we'll, we'll just have uh, one comment from each of, uh, of um, you uh, about was it um, um, an answer or a comment on the comments that we received or something you wanted to say? Uh, one of the comments was how to reach the kids. And basically, with all the challenges we're discussing, uh, by overcoming them and discussing them, we can reach. We're not talking literally how to reach them, but basically in, in, in cooperation and collaboration, how we can do that. So Mr. Anthony. Uh, just very briefly, uh, to reach the hardest to reach, uh, we, we know how, we are developing the resources, we simply must persist. Uh, and I'm very encouraged by this session and so many others uh, to believe that we all will, working together and especially again at that community level, and the key is that the communities have the sense that they own this process. This is not something that we are uh, in charge of and imposing on them. Uh, if I could come to the last very interesting comment, uh, yes, it would be preferable if we were able to reach uh, broad agreements with these groups, but it's very difficult because they are often disparate. What is the key is, again, working at the community level, mm -hmm. uh, and there it is both trying to reach agreements with these groups, but also the fact is that these communities want 
their children to be immunized. They want water, they want food, they want yeah. nutrition. Okay. And it is the community leaders that put pressure then on the political groups that allow us to continue to work in the communities. And that's why we've been able uh, at UNICEF to work in Shabab areas and of Somalia. And that's what we call cooperation and, and operation. And in Syria across, across lines in both areas. Thank you. Yeah, please. Uh, Sanya yeah. first. Pardon? Uh, ladies first. Yeah, sure. I just want to make three quick points. On the issue of the military, I certainly cannot speak on behalf of Afghanistan, but in Pakistan, you have to understand that in vast swaths of land, there's an armed insurgency. It is the military that runs the hospitals, the schools provide water and law and order, and they're in plain clothes. If you are going to continue to put money in ghost vaccination teams, and the actual actors are going to be a blind spot, we will continue to fail to vaccinate. So this the, is the way you think we can reach uh, children. Dr. Cyrus, uh, last comment, please. Uh, you know, from the supply perspective uh, that every child has to be reached, many of the countries are going to face a supply problem, and this is where I'd like to address this problem to Dr. Chang, that for WHO, that uh, the old system was that if UNICEF or any UN agency uh, supplied the vaccine or offer the vaccine, the country would accept it and immunize their children. Now there is a recommendation that the individual countries mm. have to register the manufacturer and developing country manufacturers are going to be at a great disadvantage and I'm speaking on behalf of all of them. Mm -hmm. To register in more than 100 countries would take a few years, I don't know okay. how many years, okay. and therefore that affordable vaccine will not reach them and it's happened uh, that so many countries uh, have uh, said they won't take the vaccine even though UNICEF has offered to supply the vaccine to them. This is a very serious issue and I only request that the old uh, present system that if WHO can, you know, explain or propagate or instruct, or I don't know what, it's mm. up to them, that as long as the UN agencies have got a pre-qualified supplier mm. and they're allocating the supply, the country should accept the vaccine. And you can continue this yes. discuss, Otherwise, discussion with be, them on it, coffee it, later on. We don't have time after it'll, the break. It'll make UNICEF task easier also. Yes, please. Well, uh, first of all, um, the volunteers of Red Cross, Red Crescent come from the communities. They know each family. Mm -hmm. They know each other. They know one another in the community. Therefore, we are better listened to, we are better trusted because of this long-standing relationship. And you have thousands and thousands of them, Sheikh Abdullah. Mil mil millions and millions okay. of Sheikh them. Sheikh Abdullah, okay. uh, yani, al -kathir min al -niqat, uh, kawna, rubbama, al wujha, in kan Pakistan wa ghayriha min al dual fi uh, muhawalat iqna' al nas wa da'amihim muhatihim ala in kan al amal uh, al silmi aw fi me ta'alaq bil liqahat. Kilmi sari' ala wa I, 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 one, 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 import, one, one thing that uh, I, I would like to add, I mean, the import, one other important area is the humanitarian principles. Now, all political groups, all religious groups are bound to respect humanitarian principles, and that is what we promote. That is what adds to the trust that Red Cross, Red Crescent enjoys. Thank you. Sheikh Abdullah, الحقيقة أن القضية هي قضية جهل هي قضية جهل فقط مشكلة الجهل هو الجهل يتعلق بها الموضوع ويتعلق بموضوعات أخرى الصراعات التي في المجتمع هي ناشئة عن الجهل فلا بد أن ننظر إلى هذا البعد بعد الجهل القضية لها أبعاد وأهم بعد فيها هو أن هؤلاء الناس الذين يمتنعون هم يجهلون يجهلون قضية اللقاح يجهلون أن اللقاح جائز شرعا يجهلون الشريعة ثم يجهلون الواقع أيضا. وبالتالي نتوقع الآن تحركات من قبلكم على الأقل من أجل لا هي القضية هي قضية منهجية قضية منهجية عندنا هنا قادة عندنا شراكة الشيخ محمد بن زايد عندنا شراكة البنك الإسلامي الذي نرحب برئيسه هنا هؤلاء بإمكانهم أن يصلوا إلى العلماء نحن من جهتنا بالإمكان نصل إلى العلماء كل, كل منطقة فيها العلماء المعتبرون ليس كل عالم 
وحتى فيما يتعلق بدعم هذه المؤسسات يعني الدين الاسلامي مبني على اساس الاحسان ومبني على اساس بالتأكيد. العطاء والزكاه بالتأكيد. وبالتالي بالتأكيد. ويجب وفي التاريخ الاسلامي الاطباء المسلمين والاطباء النصارى واليهود كل انواع الاطباء يعملون معا لا يوجد اشكال شرعي طيب. من هذا وهم عند هؤلاء فالقضية هي قضية جهل يجب أن أن نوجد منشورات توصل إلى أستاذ المدرسة طيب. يعني أستاذ كل مدرسة يكون عنده منشور في هذه المعلومات لا بد أن نصل إلى القواعد فهي القضية يكون في إذاعة إذاعة تصل إلى الناس يعني, يعني قضية مختلف إعلان. وسائل التواصل الاجتماعي يجب أن تتوفر من أجل إيصال ذلك شكرا جزيلا لك الشيخ سلطان محمد عذرا ولكن انتهى الوقت نشكر الجميع لمن شارك ولم يشارك نتمنى أن تكون استفدتم عذرا تحولت للغة العربية I changed into Arabic switch Thank you very much ladies and gentlemen